pleasure to introduce Michael Grace, the president of the WCHA. Michael. Thank you, Benson. Is the audio still good? Yes. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> Excuse me, everyone. Um, welcome. I'm very happy that so many people could join us tonight. Um, what we will do is uh, we're shooting for about a half an hour of uh, presentation, and then we'll have time for questions at the end. So please feel free to type in questions, and um, Benson will collect those questions, and um, and Annie and I are here to uh, to hopefully answer them uh, as best we can. So to begin with. Um, I hope you enjoy this nostalgic look back at a time when um, we could actually canoe shoulder to shoulder. Uh, I think that our biggest worry on a day like this was how to keep the sun off of our noses. So unfortunately, um, tough time for all of us, even in the wooden canoe world. But, um, so to get started, first of all, speaking of uh, people, I wanted to give thanks to some of the many people that work it seems tirelessly literally to keep this organization running and to keep it running so well principal among those is our executive director annie burke annie really is the glue that holds this organization together she's been with us for many years she manages our finances and does so many other things including um, directing the um, the annual assembly and, and many other things so um, Anytime you have the opportunity, I urge you to give her your thanks. She is a treasure in this organization. <clears throat> we have a recent uh, new editor of Wooden Canoe, Chris Eden. Um, very happy to have Chris with us. He is incredibly enthusiastic about our Wooden Canoe world. He is part of our Wooden Canoe world, and um, he really is uh, working very diligently to make the journal the best that it can possibly be. Our store manager is Jeannie Griffin Green. She's responsible for the online store, for the store at the assembly. She is the person who uh, fills your orders um, and takes care of any problems that you may have when ordering things from the WCHA store. If you don't go there, I urge you to. There are a lot of great products that, um, that are available only there. Um, Benson Gray, can't uh, thank him enough. He is our webmaster and I like to call him our social media wizard. Tonight, he is uh, the, uh, the, the electronic organizer of this meeting. So many thanks to Benson for his support always and tonight. Um, I'll mention a little bit about the, um, the WCHA's 2021 calendar a little later, but it's produced by Jim and Betsy Wilson. They are wonderful photographers in their own right, but they do a heroic job every year to produce this, this stunningly beautiful wall calendar that um, we should all have uh, hanging in our homes. Um, I'll also mention elections for positions on the board. Our elections coordinator is Sheldon Terry, and we certainly appreciate all that he does for us every year in elections. We have a historians network, a group of people who can help with identification of canoes and information about canoe history. And the coordinator of that network is Al Bratton. Our assembly coordinator is Rob Stevens. Uh, Rob does a heroic effort every year in uh, planning the details of the annual assembly. And at assembly, Mary Gold and Lily Wellich run the children's program. And uh, I can tell you that that is just a wonderful thing that they do. Great thing for the kids and great things for their parents and, and all of us. I've been there for a number of years um, without my child, and I still absolutely love the children's program. So many thanks to them. Um, also at Assembly, our auction coordinator is Fran Sinkowitz. Uh, a lot of work there getting the big auction together every year. And our auctioneer has been Jack Nettleton for some years, um, although sometimes he's had to, uh, to step back, but he has generally been our, our auctioneer over the years. But uh, this is a small list. I assure you there are so many people that are involved. And if your name is not on this list, please forgive me. Um, but, but thanks to everyone who keeps this organization uh, moving forward as well as it does. So our board of directors, Benson has already introduced me, um, Michael Grace. Our vice president is Colleen Hovey. Our secretary, Pete Shea, is with us tonight taking notes. 
Um, Mick Dombrowski, Barclay Ford, Deborah Gardner, and Bill Van Curen also do, uh, I, I honestly, really heroic work. It, it, it is not, uh, service on the board is not taken lightly. And in the last few years, we've been wrestling with some challenging issues. And everyone on the board, everyone on this list, and those from the last few years who may have rolled off of this list, um, have really just done an outstanding job of working together very collegially um, to, 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 to keep this organization running and to, to make it even better. Um, Craig Kitchen and Richard Wallace have recently stepped back from their service on the board, but uh, we, we give them our very sincere thanks for all that they've done. And with that, I really want to encourage anyone and everyone who has a sincere interest um, in this organization, I'm sure we all do or we wouldn't be here, but also a bit of time and interest in serving. There will be four, there are coming up four open positions on the board. And we encourage people to write a statement and send it in and run for a position. Um, I can tell you that we do work. Um, it does take some time, but it, 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 it really gives back much more than it takes. It is, it's uh, an honor and a pleasure to serve. In the latest issue of Wooden Canoe on page six, you can find information about how to uh, submit your uh, self-nomination for service on the board. So um, you can also nominate others if you wish. Um, so, so please do consider it. So to the business of the organization, I think without question, the single most, thing, uh, most important thing that we worry about um, and we have for some time is membership. We are a membership organization. We're a nonprofit, membership-driven organization. That means that most of the cost of running this organization, the vast majority, are covered by membership dues. So when we decline in membership, we decline in revenue, and um, costs continue to rise. So we are constantly thinking about and strategizing about how to increase membership numbers. So this graph shows that over the past 20 years or so, we have seen a relatively steady decline in membership. The orange peaks on those bars in the middle represent a number of different uh, independent membership drives that we did, some very creative efforts, and sometimes they required hard work, and they resulted in significant increases in membership, at least in, in some of those years. Unfortunately, though, those increases were only temporary and we continue to decline at this point in time at a rate of about 2 to 2.5% per year. And so we want to stem that tide. Your board is constantly talking about the reasons why this may be happening, uh, looking for strategies to try to reverse this trend and enacting all of the strategies uh, that, that we can. So um, one of the things is, of course, our world is changing. We are a much more online world than we used to be, but despite the fact that we have had a dramatic increase in our online presence, we continue to see this slow but steady decline. Um, we do have lifetime members, and for those who have joined as lifetime members, uh, several just in um, uh, recent months, um, and uh, many more in the past, we sincerely thank you. Um, we, we did assess the relative value of those lifetime memberships to the organization, and we believe that they truly are valuable. They're also valuable not just financially for the organization, but because those are people who clearly are, are very dedicated to the organization. So to all of those new and existing lifetime members, uh, thank you for that. Again, we've been looking for solutions. Um, some of the ones that are on the table um, um, are possibly broadening the scope of the journal. A simple example, uh, I was talking to a member just the other day about a new stripper that he had built and he's taking on a trip uh, as we speak. Um, and I, I realized in speaking with him that we don't have strippers, um, represented stripper canoes, I should say, represented nearly well enough in the journal. Um, but there are other things, you know, we could broaden our scope to include things like Adirondack guidebooks and such. Um, I'm not advocating for that here and now. I'm just saying that this is one thing that we could possibly do 
if we wish to. Um, along, that, along those lines, we could broaden the WCHA scope. Again, nothing has been decided about this, but it is a topic of discussion. These would be big changes for an organization like ours. And you know, we can en enact some changes as a board, but something like this, I'm sure that we would certainly um, request input from the broader membership before undertaking any uh, really dramatic changes. Um, we're, and by the way, I should say, we're really not in imminent danger at all, and I'll tell you more about that later. Um, but again, membership is something that we would like to, to shore up. Um, again, we could reach out to other communities, the woodworking community, the broader boating community, uh, at least the broader wooden boating community. Um, we could begin um, new and different types of membership drives, but it's not just gaining new members, it's retention of existing members. And so with that in mind, I would strongly urge everyone who is here, clearly you're a committed group of, of members, to encourage those around you, members that you know, ask them if they've renewed their membership. I was talking with one just a couple of hours ago and saying, do you know when your membership ends? Uh, find out. If you don't know, I'll help you find out and we'll make sure that you renew in a timely manner. All right, so with, with all of that said, um, Membership is critical because membership is, in, is critical to our finances. Um, and I should say that, and you may have seen this if you look at the financial reports that are published in the journal each year, that over the past, say, 10 or 12 years, we have gone through two periods in which our financial uh, structure, outlook, whatever you want to call it, was really unsustainable. In other words, we ended the year in the red. We were we were losing money, spending money faster than we were replacing it. And so over the past year or so, more than a year really, we have been working very hard to, um, to change our financial structure so that we can better balance the book and try to rebuild some of the, um, the safety net that we have had in the past. Um, before I say much more about that, though, I want to recognize that there have been a number of significant donors who have stepped up uh, to support the WCHA, and I mean very significant donors, over the past year or so. Um, they Sometimes, especially before the last assembly last year, we had uh, a great number of canoes donated for the auction. So those in-kind donations are very helpful but we've also had some significant financial donations, and we certainly appreciate that. Um, right now, one of our great fundraisers of the year is on. Our new calendar is out. Again, thanks to Jim and Betsy Wilson. Uh, the image here is the cover of that canoe. It is a large format um, uh, wall, uh, wall hanger um, calendar. Uh, if you don't have yours already, I urge you to get it. It, uh, it really does help support uh, the financial health of the WCHA, plus it's absolutely gorgeous. They really do a great job on it. I bought five myself the other day to give to people, and I would urge everyone to get your own, and if possible, get some for others. 200 of these calendars are already gone, so they are they're moving fast, and uh, you would be wise to, to order soon. They're only $12.95, by the way, which uh, I believe is less than the average cost of a nice calendar. Um, I would argue calendars not nearly as nice as this in bookstores. So the pandemic has affected us all, and as you um, are all probably aware, we did not hold assembly, the annual assembly in uh, this past summer. The annual assembly is valuable to us. We don't make money off of the assembly itself, but the auction can bring in a great amount of much needed money for the organization each year and store sales are especially good at assembly um, other than those things we have had essentially no financial impact whatsoever um, our venue paul smith uh, college has um, graciously agreed to simply um, roll everything over to next year so, so we didn't lose money by um, having reserved uh, the, the venue and, and everything that came with the venue. So that's a good thing. Um, and I'll tell you more about um, uh, some of these things later, but um, our 2020 year-end financial outlook turns out to be excellent. 
um, again, because of the hard work of, of your board members, um, we really uh, changed our financial structure. We changed our financial outlook such that we're actually going to be able to replenish some of our investment funds that we have lost in previous years. So a dramatic reversal of where we have been <clears throat> over the last some years. 2019 was better. 2020 is fantastic. And um, we're absolutely confident that it will remain that way through the end of the year. All right, so the things that we have been doing um, and the things that we continue to do are encapsulated in a strategic plan that we developed over the course of beginning in 2019 and uh, I'm sorry, beginning in 2018 and through 2019. Um, so we have a very detailed strategic plan uh, that covers the course of five years and it is a set of um, statements about the current state of, of the WCHA, our strengths, our weaknesses, our opportunities, our threats. Um, and how we deal with those things, um, initiatives to, to ensure the long-term stability and health of our organization. So this is very brief, um, but I'll give you some examples. Um, member recruitment and retention, as I said before, is critical. So one of the things that we are doing, in fact, we're engaged in this right now, uh, literally right now, is direct contact with lapsed members to try to retain uh, members who may have, for one reason or another, let their memberships lapse. We and many others have talked about getting more young people involved in the WCHA, but we recognize that that's a complex problem. And so one of the things that we did uh, recently is reach out and contact um, about six young people, and by young people I mean roughly early 20s, in their 20s, uh, people who are not children, they're in or entering adult life and they're thinking about things from the perspective of, of that demographic. And what we hope is that they can give us some significant feedback that can help us guide our strategies for increasing uh, younger um, people participating in the organization. Um, we've also uh, been working hard to increase WCHA marketing through a variety of ways, but uh, one of those ways, um, it's actually three, uh, is to publish about our activities in other magazines and journals. And that's always very exciting, um, and hopefully it pays off in getting our name out there and getting uh, interest up in the WCHA. We hope that translates into uh, new members. Everyone recognizes, I'm sure, that membership dues went up significantly this year. Um, we, we really looked at our financial outlook very carefully. We were operating in a truly unsustainable manner. Um, we've enacted a variety of, of measures to try to stem that and to try to put us back on the right track. Um, but again, membership dues are absolutely critical for the life of our organization. It turns out when we looked at it that there had been no dues increase for seven years. So it was time for an adjustment. Um, um, we talked about it at length because we know that any increase in cost is, uh, is a burden, and a, an added burden on people. Um, I can tell you though that uh, the rate at which uh, renewals are coming in and new memberships are coming in is very good. So um, we we hope it, uh, the increase in dues um, doesn't have a, a long-term negative impact. It certainly doesn't seem to be having a negative, a significantly negative impact in the short term. So we also talk a lot about fundraisers, um, fundraising. Um, and you may recall that uh, over the winter of 2018-2019, we had an internal fundraiser um, that raised a, a significant amount of money. And we have said thank you before, but I'll say thank you again, because that was a, a one important element in reversing our, our um, uh, unsustainable financial situation. So thank you for that. When it came to the close of 2019, the fall of 2019, we had planned to do another one of these internal fundraisers, but we we really had to weigh all of our options and we decided that an increase in dues was timely and needed 
And for that reason, we didn't want to ask for additional donations from our members um, during the fall of 2019, knowing that that dues increase was coming in January. But we didn't have a fundraiser last year. However, we have um, tried to build and promote some ideas for everyday giving, things like Amazon Smile. You can read about this and find out how to uh, donate at no cost to you through Amazon uh, by looking for that in the journal. Um, we'd also like to encourage everyone, if you do give to the WCHA, if you make a contribution to the WCHA, go to any potential corporate sponsor that you may have. If you work for a large corporation, they very often have matching programs. Um, and we have gained a significant amount of income through uh, people having their donations matched. Also, if you look in the, the last issue, the issue that just came out of Wooden Canoe, you'll see on page 29, there are some um, suggestions uh, or some information about tax law that help, will help you understand possibilities for engaging in planned giving um, during uh, retirement, for example. We're also actively working now on increased advertising income in the journal, uh, not the website yet, but we may consider some mechanism for having unobtrusive to new related advertising on the website sometime in the future. But as far as the journal is concerned, we are certainly working right now to increase advertising income and decrease uh, the burden of cost on membership dues. So, since I mentioned the journal, um, we, as uh, I believe you all know, we have a new editor, Chris Eden, who has promised a bold new look for the journal and a focus on quality. Um, I personally believe that he has delivered on that promise. Um, the feedback from the membership has been overwhelmingly positive, and we certainly do appreciate that. There have been concerns, though, and um, I hope that uh, we have given you feedback that your concerns are appreciated. And I know that at least some of those concerns have been addressed. And um, please continue to give us feedback, whether it's positive or negative. Um, I can tell you, and you probably know, you can't please everyone all the time. But um, uh, we, we do want to try wherever possible to make uh, improvements to the journal that make it uh, the best that it can possibly be for all of us. And again, we are we have a current focus on increasing ad revenues, and we want to do this without loss of quality. In other words, we're not going to fill the journal with advertising. Uh, there are strategies for bringing in more money um, without any loss of quality, without any loss of page space devoted to uh, the material that we actually want to see there. Um, I mentioned before that Benson Gray is responsible for our uh, for, for much of our social media presence. Um, we now have an official WCHA Facebook site, and at this point in time, about 3,000 people follow that site. Um, there have uh, the the last uh, post, I believe, or maybe the the highest uh, reaching post reached about 41,000 people and gained about 3,000 likes. So I think we're doing fairly well there. We also have the fans of the WCHA Facebook site, which um, I'm not actually a Facebook user, so I don't post there, but I do go frequently. I love what I see there. It's a very active, a very robust site, um, and lots of wonderful things, and I think it's a, a great ambassador for our organization. Benson also posts on Instagram, um, and we have about a 1,000 followers, and uh, some of the highest um, um, viewed images there got nearly 200 likes so again i think we're doing fairly well for our organization um, if you don't already know we are working right now on a new website um, it should roll out very shortly it will solve some current and future um, problems that we know exist or will exist uh, with the current site um, but don't worry the new website will be completely seamless um, you don't have to worry about um, losing anything or being able to find the new website uh, once it goes live. Um, it, it truly will be seamless, I assure you. 
So just briefly, I wanted to mention chapters and the annual assembly. Um, given that we're in this pandemic, um, I was very pleased to see that our chapters have found ways to continue uh, to meet, at least after some hiatus. This is just one example that the Delaware Valley chapter held a socially distanced paddle on June 18th, and there are a number of other um, planned events uh, coming up in uh, regions all across the nation and, and the world. So keep an eye out. Obviously, you know, we encourage everyone to be careful, look out for your health, look out for the health of others, but um, we hope that safely we can continue to do what we love to do with the people um, like us who really enjoy our wooden canoe world. And as I said before, we are planning right now, and much of it is already in place, the 2021 Annual Assembly. We are transplanting our uh, uh, featured canoes, solo canoes, and uh, also featuring Tom McKenzie at the 2021 Assembly. The dates are scheduled to be July 13th through 18th. And you'll certainly see more about this in the pages of Wooden Canoe and on the web, otherwise, uh, in, in hopefully in the, in the fairly near future. So if all goes well, we hope that uh, we can pull this off and, and we get back to business as usual. All right, so that is everything that I have. Um, we are about a half an hour into our uh, allotted hour, so if people have questions, please feel free to ask, and Annie and I will uh, do our best to answer. And the questions, as I mentioned before, it's a, uh, you have to type into the question box. This is much too large a group to be able to have an open mic, but we do have a, actually more of a, of a statement or a suggestion that says at least one of their new chapter members thought that joining the national organization gave him automatic membership into the local chapter. And so the suggestion is maybe there could be something to make the difference and do structure more clear. And so a thought, yes, a suggestion. Well, that's a great comment. Um, and I'll let anyway on this as well, but um, my answer would be that um, we, the national, the, uh, we always say national, this is an international organization. The international organization, the WCHA itself, does not control or own or, or anything else chapters. Chapters have developed organically on their own and uh, they are a vital part of the WCHA. They allow you to enjoy uh, wooden canoe related activities in your local area supported by the, the, the larger organization. So in some cases, regional chapters have no cost. There's no due structure or anything, um, and, and that's perfectly fine. But in other cases, chapters do significant amounts of activity. They hold their own mini assemblies, for example. They put out newsletters. They do things that actually cost money. And so for that reason, it is important for some chapters to have uh, some mechanism of income. And we appreciate that. We don't want to, to, to uh, put any sort of you know, umbrella organization stamp on that. Um, so I guess the short answer, it would be hard for us to, to in any way regulate that or even, I guess, easily to inform people because it depends upon where you are and whether you choose to participate in a chapter and a variety of other things. Um, Annie, would you add anything to that? Um, no, I think you really covered it. Um, I just want to say that, yes, chapter, oh, really sorry about my cat. Um, <laughs> um, like you said, cha every chapter is different and run in a different way. Um, so there's no, there's no organization wide blueprint that they all go by. So if you're interested in local events, you search out, the enlisted in every journal is the list of the chapters that exist. Some are very active, some are less active. Look at that list, search out one that's close to you and see what you can find for activities is all I can suggest. 
All right. Well, we do have one other question here that uh, has come in. Is curious how soon you'll know if the assembly can actually be held in 2021. What's the what's the drop dead date on that one? Well, that's that's a great question. Um, we we don't have a drop dead date now. Um, again, I'll let Annie answer from the perspective of her interactions with with the venue. But um, of course, like everything else, it really depends upon how this pandemic plays out. Last summer, for example, uh, I should say last winter and spring, as we watched this uh, pandemic develop, the board talked about this practically every day. You know, what are we going to do? When do we make a decision? How do we make a decision? Um, ultimately, of course, it comes down to the health and well being of our members. But um, at some point, there became a very practical consideration when the state of New York limited the size of gatherings to something drastically smaller than the assembly. Um, so again, we really don't know what the future will hold. Will the state of New York, where, which is where our venue for next year is, will they allow a gathering the size of ours? Will Paul Smith allow the gathering to happen? Um, it, 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 it's just really tough to say at this point. Um, Annie? All we can do is, is keep you informed as we as we know. And um, our, our journals come out four times a year. So if there's important information that we feel needs to get out in between journals, we will send a, a bulk email out to our membership. Um, so we'll do our best and also put posts on the forum on the website with any updated information. Um, and we'll just do our best to keep everyone informed in a timely manner. And people are, fingers are starting to wake up. So another question, with the relatively decent financial situation that's been reported, is there any chance that the journal will once again be published six times a year? So that's another great question. And it's something that a lot of people have talked about. I'll tell you my personal opinion. I wish the journal were published at least 12 times a year. I love it. I can't wait till it arrives in my mailbox. Um, the decision to go to four times a year was not solely a financial decision. It is very tough. It, it's tough enough to produce a journal four times a year with the very limited resources and staff that we have. Um, we have a journal editor who, who is paid, but I would argue that it's certainly well below market rate. And for that, we are eternally grateful. Everyone else who works in support of the journal does it for free. They do it simply because they want to produce the best quality product they can. It's tough. It, it's hard. Um, in fact, we're beginning to work on the next issue now, and those who work on the journal were just breathing a sigh of relief when the editor contacted and said, guess what, it's start, time to start putting together the next one. Um, the other thing is, and this is uh, equal in importance, is it was extraordinarily difficult, um, especially in the last few years, to get enough material to fill the journal six times per year. It was, it was really challenging. Um, I think um, the, the, the new look of the journal and all the enthusiasm around it has solved that problem to some degree, at least in the short term. We've got a lot more material coming in, but um, we don't know if that's going to be sustainable. So, um, so it is, um, many of us would like to see it come out more often, um, but there are significant hurdles. Um, cost is one. It, it, uh, you know, it, it wasn't our main concern. I, I, trust me, it was not. But, but you know, we do recognize some cost savings. Um, of course, the journal as it is an expanded journal. So, um, you know, but still, over the year, we have a bit of a cost savings there. But again, having enough material and having enough time to prepare a quality journal is, is uh, are, are two of the important um, challenges. I, I should also mention that, and again, this goes into the category of you can't please everyone all the time, there are people who have told us that the journal at six times a year came out too frequently. 
Um, I think that is a minority opinion, but it is an opinion. Um, so the short of it is there are no plans right now to uh, increase the frequency of the journal um, uh, back to six or more issues per year. Um, but we have heard that suggestion from more than one person, and uh, many of us like the idea. And um, so we'll see where it goes. But right now, there aren't plans to increase the frequency. Okay. And another, which is more of a suggestion statement but uh, than a question, but uh, speaking of broadening outreach, Canoes are the focus, of course, non-motorized watercraft, but we have a kinship with canoe paddlers, many of whom, like myself, as we have aged, embraced lightweight pack canoes. We own both wooden and carbon fiber canoes. What we value is using the watercraft. And the suggestion is think of the Adirondack gathering at Paul Smith's during the last assembly. All of those paddlers should be interested in the WCHA and we should solicit their support. I, I suspect there's no argument with that one. <laughs> no, and I would say that that really is a great suggestion. Um, again, it, it 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 brings up the question of whether we want to consider broadening our scope. Um, and again, that could come in many forms. It, you know, we can still be the WCHA. We can still be focused on wooden canoes, but embrace um, other types of small boats and invite those people into the fold. Um, the, the freestylers, I believe, is uh, um, uh, what the, the commenter was mentioning, the freestyle paddling organization. Uh, we did meet with them last year, and um, I believe we'll meet with them next year. Uh, the wonderful group of people. Um, and by the way, many of them paddle uh, solo wooden canoes. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a great idea. And again, it, you know, it doesn't just have to be small canoes. It could be the Adirondack guidebook culture. Um, there's, a, you know, there are a variety of, of groups uh, or individuals out there. Okay, and another suggestion that uh, Paul Smith is a wonderful venue for the assembly, and I hope we continue to meet there often. Yet I would like to see some new places. I suggest that one year and five assemblies be rotated to some other place. Maybe Peterborough after the new museum is opened. Maybe Spooner. There must be many places worth seeing and paddling. Well, you can be guaranteed that we're keeping an eye on Peterborough, the new museum. It will be fantastic uh, from everything that's been promoted about it. <clears throat> um, but to the larger question, the larger comment, um, this is something that has come up for almost as long as the WCHA has existed. The problem with venues for the annual assembly. Uh, first of all, let me state that I am a huge fan of geographic diversity in this organization. I am so happy that we are an international organization. We have individuals and chapters across the United States and Canada and around the world. Um, we are largely concentrated in North America and membership wise, we're largely concentrated in the US. But the, the point is a great one, that if we could move assembly from place to place, that would be wonderful. The, the um, I don't know, the, the largest concentration of our members does happen to be in the Northeastern United States, but I can tell you that's really not the reason why, and by the way, if you don't know, I'm in Florida, so uh, I'm, I'm not near the assembly myself, other current and past board members are very far from the Adirondacks also. Um, but anyway, the point is, there are significant considerations when it comes to finding a useful venue for, for our annual meeting. You have to have a place that has uh, um, good services that can handle a group of our size, that will be interested in handling a group of our size and what we do. Um, we need food service, we need dormitories, we need um, accessible water for paddling and paddling events. Um, it, it, it sounds like, and, and I'm in the academic world, and I think that Paul Smith uh, as, as a university, as a college, is a great venue for this. And I personally thought there have got to be lots of similar places. Quite a few people who are smarter than me have tried to find great venues uh, to move this meeting to different places. 
um, and it has been extraordinarily tough to find them. If anyone knows of a place and they would like to suggest it and perhaps even do a little bit of legwork to try to find out uh, if, if they really can and would handle us, by all means, we, we would certainly be welcome to any suggestions, any input on, on other venues. So, it's a great suggestion. Well, and following up on that, the West Coast audience has checked in and said the entire membership of the WCHA is welcome to attend the Northwest chapter's spring and fall meets. So, Well, let, let me comment on that. A few years ago, I decided uh, to go out to a Northwest chapter event. Um, I've been to some other events around the U.S. and in Canada. Um, that was the farthest one I had ever attended, my wife and I. Uh, flew out there. We were hosted in royal fashion. We had the best time. Um, uh, it's a great group out there, but there are great groups everywhere. I would encourage anyone and everyone, if you can attend an event outside of your region, please do. Um, the people at every one of these events, no matter where they have been, they've been so welcoming and it's been so much fun. So um, um, thanks to the Northwest chapter for hosting us. And again, I encourage people to go to meets wherever you possibly can. So circling back to the journal now, the question is, have the problems with the mailing of the journal as experienced with the spring issue been resolved? We believe so. Um, if, if, if you haven't heard this otherwise, I'll tell you that the, the, the problem we experienced was apparently a US only problem. Journals that went to Canada and overseas uh, made it there very quickly. Uh, they made it there just as, as they always do. In the U.S., um, I don't know if we were all subject to this, but uh, it took, I don't know, maybe two months for me to receive my issue. And many people experienced similar problems, if not all of us. Um, what happened was, uh, we believe, well, we know, was truly beyond our control. We don't know exactly what happened, but um, we believe that it may have had to do with the pandemic and with social unrest in one of the hubs through which all of the journals went as they left our, um, our printer. Um, we, we hope everyone ultimately got a copy of the spring issue. If you didn't, please contact me or Annie or the editor, Chris Eden. Um, but what we did on this last issue, well, first of all, what we began doing as soon as we realized there was a problem was we reached out to our printer and asked them to do the legwork of finding out what went wrong and trying to solve the problem as best they could with the U.S. Postal Service. Um, again, I, the journal did finally start showing up um, around the nation. We're very happy about that. This current issue, if you have it, uh, hopefully you all got it. This is what it looked like. Um, I got mine very quickly, um, about two weeks after it was printed, and I heard from many other people around the nation that they did. What we did for this journal was nothing different in terms of its production and its printing, um, but we did have the U.S. Postal Service do what they call a track and trace on it so that we could follow its progress through the system. When we looked at the results of that track and trace, it appeared that the journal was on its way in a timely fashion, and very shortly thereafter, it was showing up in people's mailboxes. We do plan to keep that track and trace uh, on the journal for at least the next few issues, just in case problems arise again. Um, but again, the short answer is um, uh, it, it, it was not something that we could have controlled, and we believe that this track and trace is the best that we can do in the future to just watch the progress of the journal and try to head off problems if we see something happening. And the next question is concerning the new website. Will new login credentials have to be created to use it or access it? How's that going to work? The answer is Answer is very simple, no. The website itself um, will be accessible just as it is now. Uh, the various functionalities of the website will remain unchanged. So for example, the forums will look, feel, and behave just as they do now. Um, your login now will continue to work then. 
the only thing uh, that will change from a uh, sort of member interactive perspective is the way that the classified ads are done. And that is actually going to be simplified. Um, and I sh maybe I shouldn't say too much now, but the plan is that you won't have to log in at all. You'll simply submit your information and it will be published for you. So, um, so where logins will be required, they'll be the same as they are now. Um, otherwise, the website is completely open and accessible just as it is now. And the plan is for the classified ad submissions to be even simpler than it is now. And next is circling back to the journal. How do you suggest that ideas for an article or photos for consideration be submitted for publication? Uh, yes. Um, I said that we've, we've seen a dramatic uptick in the number of submissions, and that's wonderful, but we really want to hear from everyone. So if you have an idea for a story, if it's about the restoration of a canoe or just an interesting find or just a photo of, of, of your boat in an interesting place, it might be a trip story, any number of things. Um, if you think it might look good in wooden canoe, by all means submit. If when you read Wooden Canoe, you think, um, I really wish I could see more about such and such, or I really wish I could see an article about this, let us know. Even if you're not going to write it, we'd love to have ideas for articles. Um, but how do you get these ideas to us or materials if you choose to write or submit photography? In, in every issue of Wooden Canoe, you can find the contact information for the editor. Um, you can also reach out to me if you wish, but you can reach out directly to the editor. Um, uh, one of the things that we hear from people when they are potentially interested in submitting or if we do a little arm twisting, we often hear people say, oh, but I'm not a writer. That's okay. We can offer excellent editorial services to help you get your article in great shape. Um, it could simply be an idea. We could help you flesh out that idea. We could help you with, um, you know, recrafting the writing if, if you need that help. Um, so it really is a very simple, straightforward process. And we would love to hear everyone's stories and see everyone's photos. And, um, and again, I'll tell you, if you would like to see something in the journal, probably other people would too. So don't ever think that your idea isn't interesting uh, or exciting. If you think it's interesting, it is interesting, I, I'll guarantee you. Well, I guess that pretty well wraps it up for the questions side. So I'm not seeing any more at this point, unless somebody has a burning question they want to type in. I think we may be winding down. All right. Well, in the absence of any further questions, um, we certainly thank everyone for attending. I'm not sure. Uh, how high we got, but we're at about 60 attendees, which I think is absolutely wonderful. And um, again, many thanks to everyone who took their time to join us tonight. Yes, thank you very much, everybody. And we hope to see you, a lot of you, next summer at the assembly. <laughs>